Hello everyone and welcome to the 8.30 breakout session of the Open Simulator Community Conference for 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org and you can post your questions in there, in here in local chat or on the Ustream chat or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This hour we're happy to introduce Edmund Edgar who will be presenting Bitcoin on your grid using decentralised virtual currencies in the metaverse. Edmund is, is an IT consultant and a free software dis developer based in Tokyo, Japan. Previous clients include the British Council, the Princeton Review and Cerigo, creators of the I Know language learning site. He is the lead developer of the Sloodle project, connecting Moodle with Second Life and OpenSim. He also runs Address Machine, an open directory for Bitcoin addresses designed to facilitate decentralised peer-to-peer payment systems for online communities and maintains a money module to facilitate payment in OpenSim. Welcome, Edmund Edgar. Okay, thanks for that introduction and thanks everyone for coming. So, yeah, the way we'll do this is that I'm going to talk about the potential uses that we might have for Bitcoin um, or for, for other similar cryptocurrencies in the metaverse. Um, what I'll do, I'll talk for a bit and then I'll take some questions. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of um, kind of very, very big, interesting sort of political and economic discussions that you can have around Bitcoin. And I intend to not talk about those. Um, not so much because they're not important and interesting topics as because there are just kind of other venues where you can have those discussions. So I want to focus fairly narrowly on using this stuff with OpenSim and then if there's some time left over at the end and people want to talk about, you know, what money is or sort of, you know, inflation and deflation and uh, all, all these other things that people like to talk about related to Bitcoin, then, um, then let's do that at the end if we've, uh, we've got some time left over. So, okay, so first let me say a little bit about how money works in the metaverse in general um, and then I'll go on and talk about the role that I think that Bitcoin could play. Um, and then finally I'll tell you, you know, specifically what you'd have to do to, um, to get Bitcoin running on a grid um, and a little bit about my experimental money module that's designed to, to help you with that. Okay, so um, let me go to the first slide. Okay, so, so when Lind and Lab created Second Life, they built this um, very nice little microcurrency, as, as I guess most of you know, called Lind and Dollars. So you can pay, th pay for things very easily um, on their marketplace or directly in world using the viewer. And because it's nicely integrated with the client software, um, if you want to do something like buying an object from another resident, you can do that right there. Um, their system keeps track of everybody's balance, how much money ev everybody's got. Um, and when you make a transaction, it'll move the money from, from one column in their database to another column. And then do anything that it needs to finish that transaction, like, you know, transferring inventory from one person to another um, or letting you into a, a restricted space. And what was great about that was that it was convertible for real money. So you could build, um, build content to sell in Second Life and then you could actually you know, use that if you were doing very well to pay your rent. Um, now, they can do that because everything in Second Life happens within their own kind of internal Death Star, right? There's this one uh, monolithic system that's controlled by, uh, by Linden Lab. But one of the reasons for building OpenSim was that there are a lot of problems with having this one single vendor who runs everything and has you kind of locked into their systems. So the community built OpenSim where anybody can run the software and you're not locked into this one vendor, but that means that we don't have this one central authority that's going to do everything for us. Um, and that is a problem when it comes to money um, because a lot of existing money online money systems, uh, well nearly all of the existing online money systems are based on um, having this central um, authority. So is everybody hearing okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on. So I'm going to kind of whistle through the different features that um, money in the metaverse may or may not have, and then we can kind of look at where um, cryptocurrencies might fit into that. Um, 
So the first question, if you're, if you're looking at kind of money, money enabling your grid, is whether your money is only going to work on your grid or whether it's going to be portable to other grids. And there are some, obviously, I mean, there are some big benefits to having your own internal currency that you can control yourself. Um, one, one of the benefits is that you can print money, you know, which is a nice thing to be able to do and potentially a profitable activity. Um, if that's what you want to do or if you, if you just want to have kind of, the, you know, if, you, if you've just got a game and you just need this kind of, kind of play money, um, there's a nice module by um, Fr Fumi Hacks, who's uh, here in Tokyo with me at Tokyo University of Information Sciences. I'm just, I've just pasted the, uh, the URL of that chat. So that keep, he keeps a database. He's got a balance for how much uh, money each user has got. And then it'll handle, you know, buying and selling inventory and all the other stuff that, um, that you want to do inside the viewer. Um, so it's all nice. It's technically, you know, fairly simple. It's just a number in a database. Um, I don't know how stable it is, but, you know, it, um, if, it's, if it's not, if it's got bugs, we can fix them. Um, so, that, so that's not bad as an approach if you just want game tokens, if you, if you don't want, um, you know, a, a bigger portable convertible currency. But the next question is, do we need the money to be actually convertible into real money rather than just having these game tokens that are only in, inside the game? And, um, so so I, I don't know if you can see my, um, my chart here. It might, it might take a, a while for people to see this on the stream, but um, I, um, we, we've got the kind of the non-convertible currencies uh, or non-convertible uh, systems on the, on the left and convertible on the right. And then on the, um, the up and down axis, uh, we've got you know, whether they're portable between different grids or whether they only work on a, on a single grid. And I, I've put Linden dollars kind of in the middle of this axis because their solution is based on this big fudge, right? So according to their terms of service, they're just using these game tokens that don't have any real value. But everybody knows that, you know, Linden dollars are actually worth something. And the fact that they are worth something is what makes people want to put a lot of time and effort into creating content for Second Life, right, that they can then monetize. They wouldn't want to necessarily spend a lot of time and, and effort um, if they just wanted to game tokenize something. They want to actually, you know, ideally be able to pay the rent with, with some of the, the stuff that you make or, or at least, um, you know, get some, get some real money out of it. Um, so Linden kind of hoped that the regulators are going to believe their, their thing about the, this just being kind of monopoly money with, with no existence in the real world and, and that content creators aren't going to believe them and content can re you know, you know, creators are going to say, oh, yeah, it's money. Now, Linden have got away with that for a long time and it's not absolutely certain that they always will get away with that. Um, recently, they made a move very suddenly and ki kind of, you know, very, very badly explained um, you know, a, a apparently not very well thought out move to shut down third party exchanges um, so that they, uh, they stop people selling Linden, la se selling Linden dollars for regular money um, outside of the Lindex exchange. Um, and they uh, limited the people's ability to sell Linden dollars. Um, now that may be a sign that they're, see, they're feeling some regulatory pressure, and that they, you know, they've got people on their on their case, or they've got legal advice that, you know, they're they're kind of um, a little bit close to a, to a line here, because the the problem is that if your virtual currency is considered an actual currency, then you have to comply with all kinds of amazing regulations, um, especially if you have customers in the United States of America, which I think some people may do. Um, so recently, there was some guidance that got a lot of um, got a lot of press related to Bitcoin, but I, but I think would also apply to um, a, a metaverse currency um, that you know that was convertible and, and treated like real money um, from FinCEN. That's that's the uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which is one of the bodies that re regulates uh, financial businesses at the federal level in the in the US. And they said that if you're running, you know, a convertible virtual currency that can, can be converted into real money, then you're a money transmitter. You have to register the, with, the, with them. You have to do all kinds of anti-money laundering checks and know your customer regulations and all this amazing stuff that you probably wouldn't get, want to get involved with just running a grid. Um, and that's only one level of government in one country. Every state in the U.S. has their own regulations about this. Um, a lot of them have filing fees and, and, and bonds and things you've got to pay. And then... Every country in the, in the world will then have its own interesting, you know, reg regulation, regulatory hurdles that you, you may possibly fall foul, foul of. 
Now, if you're just doing something on a fairly small scale, you may, I guess you can probably get away with it. But behind the fact that running a convertible currency is heavily regulated, there are some real questions about sort of trust and, and responsibility in the, you know, holding somebody's money for them is a responsibility that, um, you know, is quite a, well, a serious responsibility to take on. Um, you may not want that and your, you, your users may not particularly trust you to do it. They don't, um, and where it becomes a really big practical problem is if we did what we were, people were talking about, you know, in the, in the panel discussion this morning, if we're going from just have sort of the Linden model where everyone is on a single grid to everybody flying around the metaverse going from grid to grid and taking their identities with them and potentially taking their inventory with them, um, if they're doing that, then you don't want everyone to have to maintain a separate balance in every single grid. Um, and, you know, from time to time, grids are going to go out of business and they're going to disappear and people are going to be kind of going to be peeved. So um, so if you want your money to be convertible to real money, you probably want to kind of punt the problem to somebody else. Right. You don't want to be in the business of administering a virtual currency or, you know, buying or selling a virtual currency or really anything to do with it. You just want your users to be able to use a currency, um, to, both to pay you and to pay each other. So um, one, one nice option potentially here that we've got it kind of in the portable and convertible uh, quadrant of the slide is OMC, managed by a company called Verox. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, an Austrian company. Let me just paste in the, the URL for OMC into chat. Um, so they issue the currency. You can uh, use it on different grids that accept OMC. Uh, I'm not sure what their regulatory status is, but they, they, they seem to think they're okay. Um, but obviously the, the problem with this is that having gone through all this trouble to build OpenSIM and avoid being dependent on Linden Lab, we've now made ourselves dependent on you know, the, the money company instead. Um, if they go bust or if they get bought out or if they you know, hire some idiot or if they make something more interesting and they want to focus on that instead or you know, all these different things that often happen to technology startups, then your, your, all your open money metaverse currency may suddenly go poof. And um, and and it's it just really feels like the wrong the wrong model to be running a currency. Um, I mean, they they also have kind of a license to print money for themselves and devalue everybody else's money, which um, you know I, I guess they're probably nice people. There, um, but you know if they'd been having a, a bad quarter, you, you could sort of a bad quarter, and they you know a bit short on cash. You could imagine that um, that would be an easy uh, way to get money. So. If you don't like that, then the next option that we've had up till now is to, to let people pay each other using regular money. Um, so you go through something like PayPal. Um, but that also has some issues, a lot of which come down to the need to trust that third party that's administering the money. Um, so, so one of the problems is that it's quite expensive. In a lot of cases, PayPal are going to charge you at least tens of US cents to move money from you know, one column in a database to another. Um, which is too much for a lot of regular in-world transactions. Um, another problem is that um, they, they have a lot of trouble uh, providing the same service properly in every jurisdiction. Uh, you often find a lot of crazy cases where you know, they, they, people in this country aren't, allowed, aren't able to pay you or people in this other country need to go through a lot of kind of verification hurdles before they can use PayPal. Um, and, and a third problem is that you really want these internal currency systems to act like cash, right? Um, which is how we normally do things in meat space for small transactions. That's to say, so, so, you, so you want to be able to make a transaction and then have it over and done with without the possibility that it's going to get reversed in a month or two. But it turns out that a lot of our traditional online payment infrastructure is really a system of IOUs. And there are a lot of situations where payments can get reversed. So this is true of, of PayPal and also true of credit cards. You can make a payment and then in a lot of cir circumstances you could file a claim with them and they will make some kind of minimal attempt potentially to resolve that, that claim and find out you know, who, who really should have the money. Um, and, and then they'll often reserve, you know, re reverse that payment. And the, the rules that they use to... Um, to resolve disputes tend to be a little bit arbitrary if they've got to do this for, especially for a small transaction, you really can't spend a lot of money getting to the bottom of a problem. 
So you end up with these very kind of arbitrary rules that can be gained by scammers. So there are a lot of situations where um, you know the person who should receive the money is going to going to get screwed. So that that's something we'd rather avoid. So the way we can work around all this stuff is with a just sorry finally finally kind of getting to the point, but with a, a decentralized virtual currency. Um, so. Bitcoin, as far as I know, is the is the is the first currency that's really kind of solved some of the technical problems, um, or the sort of the conceptual problems in how to do this. Um, but the um, uh, but but Bit Bitcoin, you know, creates this um, non-centralized system where nobody is individually in charge and nobody individually has responsibility. Um, now, I'm just going to read a little bit from, I, on, on the slide I put up uh, a link to the, um, the PDF that was originally bit written by Satoshi Nakamoto, who is the non-existent person who wrote the original bit, uh, Bitcoin software. And I, I'm just going to read a little bit for how he, she or they introduced um, Bitcoin, which, which I think is worth hearing because you, you may hear people out there kind of advocating, advocating Bitcoin. Bitcoin use because they don't trust the Federal Reserve or something, right? Or, the, or they think, you know, all the banks of the world, world are going bust and, and stuff like that. But it was really designed for something a lot like our problem, um, where the having these intermediaries just kind of creates too much friction and then creates too, too many costs and, and too much sort of unpredictability. So here's what um, Satoshi Nakamoto said. He said, commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. So while the system works well enough for most transactions, it stu still suffers from the inherent weakness of the trust-based model. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible because financial institutions can't evolve, avoid um, mediating disputes. And the cost of mediation increases transaction costs, which limits the practical transaction size, the minimum practical transaction size, um, and cuts off the possibility for um, small uh, casual transactions. Okay, so um, that, I mean, that, that's the basic problem that you can solve. Let me talk just a little bit about how, how uh, Bitcoin solved it. Um, there's a lot more about this on, uh, on Bitcoin.org. It's quite a you know, a kind of a big and interesting subject. Um, but conceptually, what, what's happening is that you've got this um, pseudonymous system. You can create as many identities as you like. Um, an identity consists of a key pair where you have a public bit of data that can be sent, used to send money to you and a private bit of data that you can use to spend money. Um, so anybody can make a, a payment to anybody else. All the transactions that, that you make are immediately broadcast across the whole network of all of the, of the, um, the connected uh, nodes in this peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, that usually just takes a, you know, a few seconds um, for that to happen. And then at that point, and, and at that point they're already pretty much, to mo for most purposes, irreversible. Um, but there are some weird situations where you, you may be able to still reverse a transaction. Um, then within about an hour, they, they get kind of permanently recorded in a shared uh, public ledger, it's called the blockchain. Uh, so, so within about an hour, it's basically impossible for anyone to, to reverse that transaction, except in extremely odd circumstances. Um, so the, th the thought is that if we use that in the metaverse, we're going to have portable money, reasonably cheap, cheap transactions, you know, r right now we're talking, you know, zero uh, or about one US cent typically to, to make a payment. Um, no dependence on a, on a single vendor, and this very cheap, you know, digital cash system with no single point of failure. Um, so, so that's the um, that's the thought. But let me tell you a little bit about some some of the, uh, um, the the drawbacks. One is that the exchange rate of Bitcoin varies. So I'm just going to put up a um, a graph of the Bitcoin exchange rate. Um, most currencies have somebody managing them. And because somebody's managing them, there's somebody who has the power to intervene if the currency starts to get very strong or if it starts to get very weak. Um, but Bitcoin doesn't have that because the whole idea is that you cut out this person who, who's supposed to be managing the system, who then has to, you know, d deal with all, all kinds of, you know, tedious regulations and may get lent on to, uh, to do bad things. Um, so 
what Bitcoin does instead is to have a, a mathematical algorithm which determines how quickly money is printed um, and then just lets it float freely against regular currencies. So what's happened in practice is that as more people find out about them, the value tends to, to gradually rise. And occasionally the media will, you know, pick up on some angle of, of Bitcoins and you'll have some crazy price spike. Um, and then obviously when you, you know, when you have a crazy price rise, that always goes too far and then it crashes right back. So, um, you know, it, there, there was one point in April where, you know, the, for about an hour you could, a Bitcoin would cost you 200 and something dollars and then it, you know, crashed back down to $80 or something in, uh, uh, a few hours later. Um, right now we're you know we're fairly stable at above a hundred, but you never know when you suddenly get a going to get a, a a change in the price. So so that's one problem. I'll talk in a minute about the kind of things that we can do to mitigate that um, that problem. Um, another issue is that right now buying bitcoins can be a little bit of a pain in the bum. Um, it depends a little bit where you live, but um, but it can get a little bit tedious. Um, it's got harder since April. I'll, I'll actually let me just on the next slide. I've got a, um, a a link to a site that that will tell you where you can you know buy bitcoins for your um, uh, for your jurisdiction. But um, um, it, it got a, li a little bit worse from April because um, th first of all, it was possible to buy them on with Linden dollars. On Veerwox, but then Linden Lab have shut all that stuff down, so now you can't um, you can't sell Linden dollars anymore except on the Lindex. Um, so that, that's the big problem for, for us. But also a lot of the exchanges that got started up in the early days by a couple of kind of random hackers then started to get a, a little bit of regulatory pressure. So so they've had to make this transition from you know a, some 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 smart hacker guy to a properly regulated business. Um, so, you know, they are getting there, but it, that's taking a little bit of time. But on the, on the plus side, there are a lot of smart people actually working on this problem. So, you know, if, if we just use the money in the metaverse, then we don't have to solve the problem of, you know, buying and selling currency. Um, and, and the solutions, I think, will really depend on where you live as well, because there are, there are a lot of different laws about, um, about selling money. Um, so, you know, people can, can, people dedicated to solving that problem can solve that problem, and we just, you know, use bitcoins. But what we may need to do in parallel, even if your grid, you know, starts taking, um, starts using bitcoins, is to to keep some other parallel options. So, for example, um, if you're just getting paid in bitcoins, you, you know, you, you may already have some, um, you know, a PayPal system or credit card system. So you could you could run in parallel with that. Um, likewise, if if we're doing user to user payments, um, you know, the the, the way I, I think we might be able to that my module would help with, we may be able to do that. Um, and give, give people an option of different ways of paying. Um, the third drawback I should mention is that it's not absolutely certain that Bitcoins are going to scale and still be cheap. Um, right now, I, I think I mentioned earlier, there's a transaction fee that you have to pay to get the network to, to process a transaction. And right now, it's typically either nothing or about one US cent. It is, you know, it, it's basically an anti-spam measure, measure right now just to stop people, you know, uh, just... Uh, slowing down the network on purpose um, or, or um, filling it with junk. Um, it's possible that if Bitcoin becomes very popular, we'll get some kind of a natural scaling limitation we ran into that means that the network can't handle as many transactions as people want to make. Um, and if that happens, then the fee is likely to go up. Now, I don't think this is really very likely, but it is possible it would happen. Uh, if it did happen, I think that you know the community would come up with a solution to it. Um, for example, it might be that we end up running a, another cryptocurrency parallel to Bitcoin that's optimized for um, small transactions of, of the kind that we probably mostly do in, in, in the metaverse. And then that you, um, and, and, that, so, and that Bitcoin would be used for, you know, for, big, for bigger transactions. Um, but that really wouldn't be particularly catastrophic because it should be very easy to trade between different cryptocurrencies. There, there are already a, you know, a billion different kind of Bitcoin clones out there. Um, and, it, and it should be very, very simple to trade from one to the other. Um, the, I, I guess the broader point, you know, beyond all this is that Bitcoin is an experimental um, currency. Nothing ever, like this has ever really been done before. Uh, so we don't really know what could go wrong. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about um, just doing this stuff in practice. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is... Um, yeah, either of those or something new, Litecoin or Feathercoin or something new. Um, 
So the yeah the, the the first thing I want to talk about actually about actually getting paid is the situation where um, if you're running a grid, you want to just receive money, but we're not doing actually the full user to user um, kind kind of peer to peer thing. Um, in that situation, it, it's probably fairly straightforward to um, to get started with with this, um, and there does seem to be quite a lot of overlap between Bitcoin use and virtual world interest. If you, I mean, I mean, looking at the um, the kind of sums that OMC were uh, sorry that Veerwax were doing in, in trading between um, bitcoins and Second Life uh, Linden dollars, um, there does seem to be quite a lot of overlap. So it's it seems quite feasible that it would be you know pe people out there who would um, you know who would want to pay your your grid in. Um, in bitcoins, um, if we're not doing the full user to user thing, if you if you've just got a, a grid that wants to accept money, then there are some pay, payment processing companies that will make things really easy. Um, the the market leader is BitPay. Um, I'll just post this into chat. Um, another company that's doing the same kind of thing is Coinbase. So. Um, what these guys will do is they have APIs that you can either um, code against yourself or, or you can hook up to a, um, an existing system. Um, there's a good chance, I, I guess, if you're already running a grid and you're taking money, you've probably got some kind of content management system or you know shopping cart system or something running. Um, and there's a good chance they'd have a, um, a module for that that will do the integration for you. Um, they charge a fee, but it's not very, not very much. BitPay charge, I think, just less than 1%. Um, uh, Coinbase say that I think that they're now charging 0% for your first million dollars that you accept. Um, so, you know, you've probably got a few weeks until you hit that. Um, so, um, you know, so, it's, so it's, um, it's very cheap to use. And what they can do for you if, the, if you want is that they can take the customer's, mo customer's money in bitcoins and then pay you in dollars or whatever your local currency is. Um, so that means that you don't have to worry about exchange rate fluctuations and all that stuff. You can just uh, set your price in your own currency. Um, get that money credited to your bank account, and then you don't even have to ever actually see a Bitcoin. Um, so, if you, so if you're like me and you've got a very kind of traditional accountant who hasn't really, you know, managed to get his head around PayPal yet, um, then you may, you know, prefer to do things that way. So, you know, from the from the merchant's point of view, it really works a lot like getting paid by PayPal or, or credit cards, except that it's cheaper and there are no chargebacks. So, you know, there's very little downside. Um, but th but that that covers just kind of the conventional kind kind of paying a vendor case where, where if you just want to get money into a grid or you know get money for services that you're providing or even if you want to um to have your own currency still but you want people to be able to buy that currency um that that might help you but the really interesting thing what, well, what that doesn't do is to take the role to play the role that second life uh money does that linton dollars do um so that users can um transact with other users um, so I've built an experimental module to, to handle this. Uh, it's based on the PayPal module built by, or currently maintained by uh, Snoopy Pfeffer, I think it is. Um, and a, 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 few, a few people, I think, have, have worked on this. Um, so it's designed for doing payments on the grid. What it does is, uh, I, I don't know if you can follow my, my slightly obscure, obscure um, diagram here, um, but the what it does is to broker transactions between uh, avatars or, or an avatar on the grid, but it doesn't actually handle the money, right? So um, where you'd normally pay somebody in world, instead of actually um, moving the money... Um, uh, okay, did somebody... Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly through talking, so I'll, I'll just get to the end of, uh, uh, to the end of this explanation and I'll, and I'll uh, open to questions. Um, so, so the the core functionality is to is to broker transactions. Um, if it, so, so what it'll do is where you'd normally pay somebody in world instead of immediately moving the money when you do something with the, with the client to say you know buy it by a, a an object or whatever, um, we pop up some kind of a dialogue um, telling the user to uh, pay this address. Um, so we can do that either with an instant message or with a um, with a, 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 a an open URL dialogue. Um, so if it's a user-to-user -user transaction, then we give them the address of the, the, the other resident. Um, if it's a user-to-grid transaction, we'll give them a, you know, a, a Bitcoin address belonging to the, to the grid. Um, and then the module then watches the Bitcoin network. So it's the Bitcoin network that's actually handle, handling the money, waits till it sees the payment getting made, and then finishes the transaction um, by giving the person an object or doing whatever it needs to do. 
Um, so you can set prices in Bitcoin so, uh, if you want to on your grid, or you can set them in another currency, and the system will convert that into uh, Bitcoins for you at the point when it's bought. Um, there's something to be said for setting prices in dollars and then converting, um, because, you know, as we said before, the, the value of Bitcoins can change kind of fast. Um, so if that happens, you don't want to have to change all your prices. And, uh, and also, if there are situations where you, you provide refunds, then that may get kind of fiddly. Um, so, um, so, so there's that. Uh, that's the basic functionality of the, of the module. Um, I'll, I'll give you a URL for my module here. If anyone's interested in running this, this hasn't actually been you know, tested in, in production on a live grid. Uh, so it's a little bit experimental, but if anyone you know wants to start running this on their grid, then I, I can work with you to um, to make sure it behaves. Um, so so that's what we can do um, uh, as it is with the existing client. If we wanted to make this really smooth, um, what we'd really want to do is to integrate it with with the client. So. Um, you know the the second life experience is very seamless because the because you can actually spend money from within the client. Um, that doesn't work with kind of the, the security model where the server uh, isn't trusted by by the client, which we you know, which is what we've got in the OpenSIM um, scenario. Um, but there are, there are a lot of cases where right now we have to. Uh, do I move setting up grids? Um, I'll, 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 I'll just get through this and then take some questions at the, at the end. So, um, so, so, the, so the situation is that in the uh, Second Life client, if you want to make a purchase, you, let's say you want, you want to buy an object, um, you click the object, it would say, it would say this costs you uh, 10 Linden dollars, do you want to pay this Linden dollars, you take this 10 Linden dollars, you click buy and then you're done. Um, as it is with the, um, the, the, uh, um, the, the module integration that I've done, and, and this is also true of, uh, of OMC and of, um, of, the, of, of Snoopy's PayPal um, module, you need to pop up a URL or at least you know, have, have some kind of, um, some kind of, uh, of, uh, of chat or instant message going through. Um, and then the user has to go through an additional step uh, to make the payment. And that's something that in theory we could actually kind of integrate with the client um, so that um, you know, we, we take out all those extra steps. Um, so if anybody who, d who does, it's a little bit, you know, beyond my expertise, but if there's anyone who, who, who hacks clients, then, um, then let's talk and we can, uh, we can either fix the client to, um, to handle it better, or we can, we can make a, we could either kind of build a Bitcoin client into the, into the viewer, or we could run little kind of parallel Bitcoin client that, that talks to the viewer and, and make that whole thing a whole lot smoother. Okay, so so, so um, that's what I wanted to say. But that we you probably got some some questions. Um, so yeah, so, so whatever questions or comments um, you've got, please uh, please jump in. Um, like I say, I, I if 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 you've got very gem very general kind of you know spectacularly raw questions about Bitcoin, then uh, then let's take those, those later. But if there's anything you know specific stuff about what we talked about, we, we should probably cover that first. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you, you've got any questions coming through to Cam. If not, then we can go home. No, there's no questions coming through here. Okay. Okay. So we'll. Okay. I'll just put my address. Wrap that up. If there's no there. questions. Yep. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, Edmund, for a terrific okay. presentation. Cheers. As a reminder to our audiences, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Oh, um, room, Maria's got some questions. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Go, go for it, Maria. Um, I, so Maria's question was, um, as regulators start book looking at Bitcoin, will transaction costs rise? Um, and I, I think the answer to that is no. Um, so the, the reason, so, so uh, 
a, a bit of background for anyone who's just tuned in. The, the, the issue was that um, if you're someone like PayPal or, or if you're a bank, if you have to get, that's right, if you've, if you've got to do um, anti-money laundering and um, all, the, all, this, all, all these other, and, and, it, and also if you've got to do uh, dispute resolution, um, then you have a lot more overhead. Um, now, the point about the, the Bitcoin model and the reason why um, at least the transaction cost of spending Bitcoin shouldn't rise is that there is nobody there to regulate, right? So, um, so, so all this regulation is stuff that applies to intermediaries who handle the money, um, but Bitcoin takes away the intermediary. Um, so, so likewise, the yeah, the the anti money laundering stuff and the know no your customer stuff, this shouldn't apply to people who are just users of Bitcoin, right? So, um, so, so I think we can put ourselves in a position where both the grid operator and the users are just users of Bitcoin. They're not people who are operating a virtual currency. Um, the, the the virtual currency is operated by you know a bunch of anonymous uh, nodes. Um, and, and if you look at the, for example, the FinCEN guidance that I posted earlier, you know, that does seem to be the way they see it as well. Um, the, that said, the people who are having to deal with all this stuff are the people who sell you Bitcoins. Um, and that right now, they're getting absolutely clobbered. I mean, the, you know, like I said earlier, you had these, um, you know, the, these, little, um, these, these little companies of a, of a couple of guys and... Um, and now they're having to deal with, you know, this absolute torrent of, you know, of, of, of really amazing regulatory free stuff. And, um, and they've been having, a, they've, they've really been, been struggling with it. And there's kind of an evolutionary process going on where, um, you know, the, the companies that aren't able to adjust to that are, are going out of business. The, you know, the, the exchanges like that are going out of business. Um, and only, I, and the exchanges, I think, will only really list, ex exist on two levels. You'll either have to be very big so that you can afford, uh, afford all the legal costs of, of doing all that. So, so I think um, Mount Gox, for example, will probably survive that. Coinbase will probably survive that. Um, these are, you know, really quite well-funded um, companies. Um, so you'll be quite big and fully licensed, or you buy it sort of very small, right? You buy, you know, you buy bitcoins from your from your friends or or locally or under the radar. Um, so, so I think we'll see those two um, kind of extremes for buying bitcoins. But you only have to do that once, and the companies that do, ha you know, de deal with that level of regulation will only have to, you know, deal deal with it w once. Effectively, it's it's not like everybody in the eco ecosystem has to deal with that. Um, so, sorry, that that was kind of a long answer, but no, I I think the answer is that um, that Bitcoin transaction costs won't rise as a result of more regulation. Buying bitcoins, the cost of doing that will rise, but the the end user probably won't notice. Uh, to to the extent that the end user notices, it's gonna it's actually more likely to be kind of you, you know you have to give, give an actual identity to the person you buy your bitcoins from, stuff like that. Um, but that doesn't have to be the grid. So I'm saying make that problem go away. Uh, let somebody else deal with it. Um, yeah, that's right. Accepting yeah, accepting bitcoin on the web is simple, and rates can be factored in. That's right. Um, and rate, rates can, yeah. Ah. Right, so, so Maria's question was, what about using Bitcoin in world? Are, are the exchange rate fluctuations going to cause a, a, a lot of pricing issues? Um, we can do the same thing here, and my, my module does this. Um, you can set a price in dollars, or, or whatever currency the, you like to work in, and then at the point where you pay, we convert that into... Um, into bitcoins and we pay that number of bitcoins um, if you're not going through one of these you know processes like BitPay and, uh, and Coinbase who will do the conversion for you then you you've got I guess a little bit more of a, of a, of a currency risk if you're also using the same me mechanism as a grid to accept money um, but, but I, 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 yeah, I, I don't think it would be would be too bad um, the the I, I guess the big issue is more that the cust that the user who's actually you know got the bitcoins they're seeing the value of the bitcoins that they bought go up and down, um, which may, which may be a little bit hairy for them, um, 
but but you know it goes up as well as down so so i think it's not disastrous and I, you know i i don't want to you know sound like i'm just trying to duck responsibility for everything but it's kind of someone else's problem uh i'm i'm actually i'm, I'm suggesting both for, for for different use cases um so um so the, so the bit the bit pay suggestion was if you're a grid and you want to get paid uh, you may be getting paid, you know, to sell another currency, or you may be getting paid, you know, as a um, to to let people in. Um, for the, um, but yeah, for, but but I'm, I I'm I'm also suggesting well, this is where the the module comes in that you could use it as an as an actual in world currency. Um, if it's an actual in world currency, and you if if you're um, selling some now now we can still, you know, set prices in dollars and convert when they're bought. Um, if you, the, there is a possibility that having received some bitcoins for something that you worked on, the value of those bitcoins is going to drop. You know that 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 amount of volatility is is there. Um, you can you can kind of get out of it if you sell them quick, but um, um, but you know that 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 certainly is is going to be there. Um, but but I, I think it would be tolerable if if you're you know working on a fairly small scale and if if it's not if you don't have a lot of costs. On the other side of of, um, um, of of the income that you're earning, does that make sense? Right. So, so if you're going to price in dollars, then you would show right. You you can't show. So so at least with with my module, you can't show your balance in the viewer at all. Um, this is something that we need um, we need um, we need client integration for. Um, you can do that with uh, you, you can't do that with PayPal either, but you can do it with OMC right now with Linden Dollars. That's right, um, because the server keeps your money for you. Um, so, so you won't be able to show your um, your balance in the viewer. You will be able you'll be able to set prices of things in world. But if you want to do what I've suggested and convert into dollars to get rid of the exchange rate volatility, then you're gonna have a you're not going to be able to see the bitcoin price hovering above your object right so 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 if i've put an object out for sale there are two ways we could have done it right we could have either done the whole thing in bitcoins in which case you put a bitcoin price price above the object but then you've got a problem if the exchange rate changes that you've got to go and reprice it um or we do the whole things in 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 dollars and we have the um the money module convert and in that situation you'd show the dollar price over the object and you don't know the Bitcoin price until you click to buy it. Did that answer the, the question? If, if, we do, if we did the client integration, by the way, then, then it would be lovely. We'd see the, the balance you know, on the viewer or on, on the little kind of mini wallet that we'd, um, that we'd uh, interact with the viewer. Um, and it would just be your balance. You create, control your money. It would you know, it'd work, work really well. Um, No, no, nobody's using it yet. Uh, so, so I need the, the the first brave person to step forward to, to at least to um, to use the the module uh, that, that that I that I was working on. Um, if you don't want to use the the module and you just want to use BitPay or um, or Coinbase or something, I, I don't know if anyone's doing. That nobody that I know of is taking Bitcoin yet. Um, but like I say, it, it's a very trivial thing to do. Okay, anything else? I guess we're, we're just about done. Okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, doesn't seem to be. Okay, so we'll wrap that session up. Thank you again, Edmund. Thank you. 
Okay, and just to remind everyone in this room, the next session is going to be New World Studio, Open Sim Setup Tool for Dummies with Maria Korolov and Olivia Bettini. Thank you again to our speaker and to the audience, and we'll be back shortly with the next session.